Hey guys, Pastor Jurgen here. I'm so glad you're tuning into one of our powerful messages that is guaranteed to absolutely elevate your life to another level. At Awaken, we only want to preach fresh, real, powerful to help you grow stronger in your walk with God, develop your faith so you can take more territory. I'm praying that God blesses you and enriches your soul as you listen to this amazing word from God. God bless you. All right, come with me. <laughs> come with me in your Bibles. I, I really actually do have a great word uh, for you this morning. Luke chapter 14, Luke chapter 14. I shared uh, an outline of this with our, with our um, Pathfinder apprentices on Tuesday night. So I'm just going to double down, go a little bit deeper. But the title of the message today is Lessons from the Invited. Lessons from the invited it may not make any sense, but when we jump into this passage, it, it'll it'll jump out at you, and it'll all come together. So uh, Luke chapter fourteen verse fifteen says, "Now when one of those who sat at the table with him with Jesus heard these things, he was so impressed with just what Jesus was saying, and he he, he gushes out, blessed is he who shall eat bread in the kingdom of God." And then Jesus said to him, "A certain man gave a great supper." and invited many. Everyone say invited. invited. Invited many. And he sent his servant at supper time to say to those who were invited. So he invited many. He sends his servant to get to those who were invited. Come, for all the things are now ready. But they all with one accord began to make excuses. The first said to him, I have bought a piece of ground and I must go and see to it. I ask that you have me excused. And another said, I bought five yoke of oxen and I'm going to test them. I ask you to have me excused. Still another said, I've married a wife and therefore I cannot come. <laughs> that made no sense to me until Pastor Charles explained it. <laughs> That's not true, by the way. And the <laughs> so the servant came and reported these things to his master. And the master said of the house, being angry, he said to the servant, go out quickly into the streets and lanes of the city and bring in here the poor, the maimed, the lame, and the blind. And the servant said, master, it is done as you commanded, and still there is room. Then the master said to the servant, then go back out into the highways and the hedges and compel them to come in so that my house may be filled. For I say to you that none of those men who were invited shall taste my supper. In other words, I don't want any room in case they change their mind. Oh, I'm sorry, uh, you missed out. It's now full. Every seat is taken. So there's three categories of people in the story. The first category is the invited the invited. The second category is those who are brought. He says, you know, go, go into the highways and lanes and bring in the poor. Bring in the poor. Bring in those who, who, who can't pay their own way, who can't sustain themselves, who can't bring in the poor. Bring in the lame, people that have no strength to, to, to stand. Bring them in. Bring in the maimed, those who have lost something and now disabled or or disadvantaged and bring in the blind, those who have no vision. They need to be brought. Pe people need to be brought into the house of God who, because the house of God is a house of restoration. You'll find that vision comes. You'll find that strength comes. You'll find that prosperity comes. You'll find that things that were lost can be recovered in the house of God. But the third category was the compel. You know, go, go into the highways and byways and compel them to come in. There, there are some people that are so stuck in their poverty. They're so stuck in their dysfunction. They're so stuck in their brokenness. So go to the highways and the hedges and the, the, the vagrants and the, va the addicted and the broken and the, go, go and compel them to come in. Now, I know that this, this patch of scripture, Pastor Sterling, is always preached in the context of evangelism. Uh, you need to understand that, that, that God wants his house to be filled. God wants his house to be filled. I'm not sure if you realize this, but the nature of God is whatever space God enters, He fills. Whatever space God enters, He fills. The Bible says the angels cry, holy, holy, holy. The whole earth is full of His glory. The Bible says when they were in, in the upper room on the day of Pentecost, suddenly they came from heaven, the Holy Spirit. It sounded like a rushing and it filled the house where they were seated. The Bible says when they dedicated the temple and the glory of the Lord came, it filled the temple. Isaiah 6 says he saw 
the Lord high and lifted up and seated on the throne in the train of his robe, filled the temple with glory. Wherever God turns up, he fills. Wherever God turns up, he fills. He says, be ye filled with the Holy Spirit. So, so God is a God that, and so he says, my house shall be full. My house shall be full. I want you to know that, that God is filling. That's why we're having to, to, to spill from the fill into Beho. Beho is literally just we're, just, we're just trying to keep up. God gave me a word. He said, if you buy buildings, I'll fill them. If you buy buildings, I'll fill them. If you buy buildings, I'll fill them. We have multiple services, all, all of our locations, because I know that the, God's heart is to fill. He wants to fill you with glory. He wants to fill you with joy. He wants to fill your heart with love. David says, my heart is filled with a new song. My heart is filled with overwhelming joy. My heart is filled with a new song. God wants to fill your life with good things. He wants to fill you with power. He wants to fill you with goodness. He wants to fill you with His promises. He wants to fill your life with heavenly realities. So we know that God is a God of filling. But I want to come back because what intrigues me about this story is that the, the, we know there were people brought and we know there were people who were compelled. But I want to go back to the original. The, the original people, they, these were the ones who were invited. These were the ones who were invited. To, to be invited means that, that I'm, I'm sitting down and I'm making a list. Who are we going to invite to the supper? Oh, we've got to have Obi-Wan Naomi. We've got to have Naomi Ki Illinois, the Hawaiian sensation. We've definitely got to have, we've got to invite this, this, this magnet. We, we've got to invite the Max. You can't have. And so, so there's intentionality. There's intentionality. There's thoughtfulness. There's preparation. What kind of food are we going to have? What, 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 what are the table settings? What are the decorations? What's the decor look like? There's intentionality. We know that from the story that we just read that the master gets upset because they all began to make excuses. But I began to think, if, if you look at the excuses, these people have qualities. They weren't brought or compelled. They were invited. So today I want to give you three lessons from the invited because heaven has an invitation for you and I to be something. Now I've got a, I've got a great little thing at the end because... Unlike these guys, you don't have to let these things take you out. However, they were taken out, not because they were slack. They were taken out because of a lack of management of God's blessing. So I want to give you th those three things. The first one, go to verse 18. In verse 18, the first one said, uh, listen, I've just bought a piece of ground and I must go and see to it. I ask you to have me excused. The first quality of someone invited is that of a territory taker. A territory taker. When, when, when we first moved here in 2005, uh, people began to, to tell us about how difficult and all the obstacles and everything, how, how San Diego is no zoning for churches and, you know, we should just kind of rent schools or rent places because even if we found a church, even if there was a church that came available, there was already a lineup of other pastors who, who have been here longer than you have, Mr. Blister, and who, who would, would, you know, would buy it. Plus, you know, um, as a brand new startup, you don't have any capital and San Diego is the fifth most expensive city in, in America. And so they gave me all these excuses. But I, I felt very, very clearly from God that we weren't meant to rent buildings. We're meant to buy them. Uh, so with another passion, he's like, I don't understand why y'all buy buildings. You should just rent them. The problem with, with, with renting buildings uh, is that you have a landlord. And you asked Pastor John the fights that we had to have or that these guys had to have with the landlord over this building, Balboa, uh, in 2020, trying to, trying to force the, the, the closure, force us to uh, obey the, the ridiculous overreach by Mussolini and the, the government mandates. And, and, and we had to push back. We had to, because, but we had a landlord. When, when, when you take territory, when you take ground, you, you actually have authority over that territory. You have authority over that territory. Um, you know, I can't, I can't jump the fence into my neighbor's yard and just start pulling out plants. It's like, hey, what are you doing? Oh, I just thought I'd rip out some of these. I like them. I'm going to put them in my yard. Like I'm going to get prosecuted. Why? Because I don't own that land. I own my land, but I don't own his land. So I have authority. I have authority over what I own. Let me just say that. I didn't realize it at the time, but one of the reasons, 
one of the reasons that the first one that's introduced here is a territory taker because you and I have to become territory takers. Every, every building that we own, every piece of property that we own, we actually diminish the devil's authority. See, the devil, the devil in Luke chapter 4 takes Jesus high up onto a mountain and shows him all the kingdoms of the world, all the kingdoms of the world. And he says, all these belong to me. And if you'll bow down before me, I'll share them with you. And Jesus says, I I didn't come here to share. I didn't come here to coexist. I know it's a clever bumper sticker, but I didn't come here to coexist. I came to crush your head, remove the keys and restore the kingdom. But but the devil, the devil believes that he owns the uh, owns the world. In Job, the Bible says that, you know, there was a day where the angels came and presented and Satan also came among them. And God says to Satan, where have you come from? He says, I've come from the earth, from walking back and forth and traveling to and fro upon it. It was an arrogant statement. It was a defiant statement. It was a rebellion. He's a spirit of rebellion. He says, you know where I've come from? I've come from my domain. I walk back and forth every place the sole of my foot shall tread. He, the devil says, I'm walking on my terra firma. I'm walking on the land that I, the reason that we have so much warfare and so much attack over buying properties, you know, God bless you. Next week we, we go to Bayho, but Pastor John will tell you they were, they were, they were, they weren't kind to us. They put us in a bidding war with the developer. This, this, was, this was a property that for hundreds of years, people gave their tithes, people gave their offerings, people gave sacrificially because they wanted this, they believed in the, the vision of Salvation Army and William and Catherine Booth and, and people got their commission orders, people got, you know, ordained there, people got married there and then this, because they were spiteful that we were open and they were closed and they, they shrunk and we grew that they said no we're going we don't want to sell it to awaken church we're going to sell it to a developer we can get more money so they put us in a bidding war and i felt god just say just 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 go into the bidding war just, just i'll restore i'll repay everything so we had to pay over asking price, but God said, that's just the battle. There's just the battle, the insecurity and the greed and everything. But I knew we had to take every piece of ground that we've gone to warfare for. The reason there's warfare is because the devil knows that everything that we own, he doesn't. And so we diminish, we diminish his authority. We diminish his dominion. We diminish a kingdom is a king's dominion. A king only has dominion over his kingdom, over his region, over his territory territory, anything outside of that territory. Some, so every time we, we buy a, a building, now I know people say over the years, well, pastor, the church isn't the building, the church is the people. I know, I know, but the people have to gather in a building. And let me just say this, it's not even, we, we don't even call these, you know, ch- we call these altars. These are altars where, where worship and prayers go up and power and answers and miracles and breakthroughs come down. It's a place of interaction. And we're going to have, you know, at least 16 in San Diego because I'm going to keep punching holes in the devil's authority. We're going to keep diminishing. We're going to keep pushing back. We're going to keep Jesus says, I will build my church and the gates of hell will not... We're going to keep pushing back on the kingdom of darkness, diminishing that. I'm telling you this, I'm prophesying, I'm telling you, in in the decades to come, people will say, oh, well, you live in San Diego? Yeah, that's a Bible Belt area. It, It will become a Bible Belt area because of the continual pushing forward and the continual taking ground from the enemy. If you wonder why that's a Bible Belt area and that isn't, have a look at the number of churches where the churches are, the the, the devil's dominion is decreased. And so we are taking ground from the devil. Can somebody say amen? Amen. It's, uh, you know, it's it's just an interesting thing. Uh, Pastor Phil Pringle said that he wouldn't send anybody out to plant a church who has never first bought personal property. He says, because if they can't take it personally in the natural, they won't be able to do it spiritually in the kingdom. So there's something about taking territory. Now, let me just say this, and I said it to the 830, and I want to say it to you. Uh, You don't need to have fear with right now, well, you know, the banks are failing, and is this the end of the dollar? Is that, you know, all this, you you don't don't need to fear. You can actually sit this recession out. In 2008, they told told me, hey, listen, there's a recession coming. I went to this church conference, and they're trying to, you know, here's, here's our recession plan. I didn't like any of it. 
I'm like, oh, man, whoa, wow, what? And, uh, and I just said, gosh, darn it. You know, I just wrote down all this vision stuff and, oh, man. And I said, would you guys be offended if I just kind of sat that one out? And uh, here's what I found. I found that the, the recession's optional. Watch this. I had a pastor say to me, he was kind of all smug. He goes, oh, yeah, I bet you're not preaching on tithes and offerings anymore in 2008. Now they're in a recession. <laughs> and I'm like, yeah. In fact, if anything, I've doubled, doubled down. He's like, what do you mean you've doubled down? He goes, it's a recession. People are losing their homes. There's foreclosure. There's instability in the markets. The, you know, the Dow crashed, the NASDAQ. Like he's, and he's you know, going through the roof. I said, yeah. So in 2005, when everything was honky-dory, I could have preached the cat and the hat came back and taken an offering. I said, but now I better make sure I'm doubling down because if people don't have God's principles, if they don't operate in God's word, they're not going to make it. The Bible says when you and I bring the tithe. See, every king in a kingdom has two responsibilities. A king has to protect and provide. If a king can't protect his people, his kingdom is ransacked. If a king can't provide for his people, that they are crippled and weak and vulnerable to be attacked. He loses his kingdom if he doesn't protect and if he doesn't provide. When you bring your tithe, you're saying, God, you are the king. You are the melech. You are the authority over my life. The king is the one with the final say, the final vote, the only vote. When you come and you say, I'm going to bring my tithe into the storehouse, God says, test me. If I will not throw open the windows of heaven. Notice he doesn't say, if I'll, you know, command the ground. He says, I'll open the windows of heaven. You know, you know what, what um, the Biden administration hasn't figured out how to tax yet? The windows of heaven. You know what George Soros hasn't figured out how to stop yet? The windows of heaven. Do you know what? No devil in hell can stop the windows of heaven. God will open the windows of heaven. You will live in a supernatural economy. I talked to, to one of our, our wealthy, uh, beautiful family in our church, and they started their company in 2005. And I'm like, oh, my gosh, we started our church in 2005. Their company is now worth over $2 billion. And I'm like, oh, my gosh. And he says, we've made all of our, all of our money in recessions. In recessions. Most Christians will quote to you that the wealth of the sinner is laid up for the just. You know, the, the, the wealth of the wicked is stored up for the righteous. And we know all of that. And you'll hear the prophets prophesying there's going to be a transfer of wealth. God is going to transfer the wealth from the sinner into the hand of the, of the godly. We're going to see the, the wealth of the wicked and the unrighteous coming into the kingdom of glory. And everyone's like, woo, woo. everyone's excited. Lord, transfer, transfer. But nobody, nobody wants to understand that the transfer actually happens in volatility. In, in what, what, when you look out, the faithless and the fearful are right now panicking and full of anxiety. You don't need to because God is actually doing a transfer. You're going to be picking up property. You're going to be taking territory for cents on the dollar by the fearful, the greedy that have overextended themselves. They're going to be losing it. And you're like, I'll take that. Thank you. And I'll take that. Thank you. And I'll take this one. And you're going to, you're going to come out of this. There's going to be a transfer. I'm telling you, there's always going to be uh, corrupt and wicked people in authority. So we're going to continually have, you know, recessions like this. You don't have to participate. There'll be another one. Amen. The amount of morons in government, there'll be another recession. They'll run it into the ground again. And don't think this is the first time. Don't, don't think, you know, oh, this has caught God off guard. Don't think God's in heaven going, Gabriel, Gabriel, what, what do I do? There's a recession down here. Oh man, I wish I didn't write half this stuff. It's not relevant anymore. Do you, do you really think this is the first time we've had knuckleheads in, in office and in power? We've had greedy, corrupt, capricious, dicta in power. For, and you know what keeps prevailing? The Word of God. You know what keeps prevailing? The kingdom of God. The kingdom of God will continue to advance. That's why the most important thing is for you and I to be in the kingdom of God because you will flourish. But one, one, of the, the, one of the great qualities of a kingdom of God person, of, of an invitee, is they are a territory taker. Am I right, Pastor Charles? Come on, territory taker, Charles Fuller, in Jesus' name. Uh, you know, one of the biggest battles we've been having lately is Coronado. And I'm like, you know, I like Coronado. Leanne likes Coronado. We, 
We, you know, the Del Coronado, you're right on the beach. It's got the restaurants. It's beautiful. And, uh, and so, you know, Pastor Mike Yeager's like, hey, Pastor, you know, what about a, a campus in Coronado? I'm like, well, you know, it's kind of a sleepy little, you know, I don't know if you want to mess with it. Like, I just like going down there and, you know, having a, a sense of anonymity and don't have a campus there. You know, I can eat in a restaurant and just eat in the restaurant. That, that's fun. <laughs> Not after. Anyway, so, so, but, you know, they were all, you know, and I'm like, all right, knock yourself out. Let's, you know. Oh, my, all of a sudden, I mean, the vitriol and the hatred. I'm getting these, someone started a fake account and follow me, and then they're just nasty, nasty. Like, I'm like, wow, you live with a lot of hate. Oh, he can spread hate. Well, actually, sweetheart, you might want to reread your text. I don't know if I've seen so much hate. I don't even know you, but, you know, and all this hatred. And then they, they did a 40,000 home uh mailer saying that Awakens is cult and, you know, you've got to resist it. And then we were looking to start in the Marriott Hotel and they, they bombarded the manager of the Marriott Hotel with all this. And so the manager got all fearful and so cancelled our, our contract. And then um, when we went down and tried to renegotiate, he said, all right, but instead of 1500 a Sunday, 10000 a Sunday because of all the attack that I'm getting. And so I get this another message. They start another fake account because I blocked the other one saying, ha, 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 what is it, how is it that the locals are driving your grifter blank off the off the island, da, da, da. and uh, so anyway, so I just thought, oh, wow, okay. There's a lot of warfare over this tiny little peninsula. I'm like, why? I, I don't understand, God, why? And God's like, what's it called? I said, Coronado. He's like, there you go. I'm like, yeah, it's a sleepy little, like, God, honestly, if we don't, I don't really, we could have one in the city, it's like five minutes. And he's like, no, no, you don't get it. Coronado, crown. He says, you see it as a sleepy little, you think when you look across and you see the high rise in the city, that that's the seat of the devil's authority. The devil has hidden his crown across from the city on crown, on Coronado. And the devil doesn't want to lose his crown. He doesn't want to lose his authority. That's why the, the attack for Coronado has been so vitriolic. That's why it has been so intense. That's why it's because the devil knows that if you take his crown, he has no authority. When David when David went out and, and fought Goliath, when he, when he slew Goliath, the Bible says that the stone, bam, was a kill shot. Down he goes. Blood is pooling from his head as he, lays as he lies face down. But David goes up and he takes Goliath's sword. Now you would think that David would take the sword and plunge it through Goliath's heart. But he doesn't. David does something different. He takes the sword and he cuts off Goliath's head. And what the Bible says, and when he lifted Goliath's head, the Philistines fled. Why did David... Because David understood warfare principles that we have lost in the Western world. The head, all the way through the Bible, speaks of authority. When David took their champion's head, he says, I now have authority over the Philistines. That's why the entire Philistine army fled. The Bible says that David, God gave David victory over the Philistines all the days of David. He never lost one battle against the, the Philistines. Why? Because he had authority. Because if, you, if you're a WBA, WBO, and you beat the champion, all their belts transfer to you. All their authority transfers to you. When David took his head, when we take the head, when we take the crown in Coronado, the devil knows that it is over for him in San Diego. We're going to see things shift. We're going to see things shift in the education, in the government, in the spiritual atmosphere of the region. That's why there's warfare. <clears throat> Become a territory taker. Become a territory taker. Number two is, he says, I've just, verse 19, he says, listen, I've just bought five yoke of oxen and I'm going to have them tested, would you please have me excused? The first one that was invited was a territory taker. The second one was a producer. He had five yoke of oxen. Five is the number for grace. You got five fingers on each hand, five toes on each foot. Five is the number of grace. He's got grace and oxen. Oxen in the Bible is always symbolic of servants. 
the oxen, they, they, they would put a yoke on the oxen. The oxen would plow the ground, would plow the field. He says, I've just got five yoke of oxen and I'm in the marketplace and I'm plowing. I'm breaking up the ground. I'm breaking up, removing all the, the, the stones and all the rocks and all the logs and all the, the, the old roots and, and the clay and the difficult soil. I'm breaking it all up so that I can seed it, so that it can go from just a piece of dirt or a piece of land into a a fruitful orchard into a place that is producing fruit, into a place where, where, where I can produce great harvests. Please have me excused. Can I just tell you that God wants you to operate in the marketplace in your grace gift, in your grace gift. God has graced every single one of us. I, I, I remember talking to Pastor Colin Higginbottom, and he said, you know, um, he, he had a different life where in church he wanted to serve God. But there were only two options to serving God. Either you became a pastor or you became a missionary. And because he didn't want to go to outer Mongolia or, you know, the deep, deep, darkest Africa, he said, well, then I guess I'll become a pastor. He had no idea that 99% plus of people in the house of God are going to be sent into the mission field of the marketplace. In the marketplace of the marketplace of ideas, the marketplace of technology, the marketplace of education, the marketplace of media and arts, the marketplace of entertainment, the marketplace of education, the marketplace of government and politics. It's in the marketplace that you find your grace gift. It, you, you, you take your five yoke, uh, your five oxen, and you go into the marketplace and you become a producer. It's, it's, it's an, amazing, an amazing thing that the church gets, gets ragtagged all the time about, about prosperity and increase and wealth. Let me just say this. The Bible does not say that money is the root of all evil. The Bible says the love of money is a root. Not the root, is a root of all kinds of evil. So it's very, very simple. Don't love money, love God. Use money and love God. There are a lot of people, they use God and love money. No, 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 flip it around. Every motivational speaker, they all do it. They all use God's principles because they love money. They don't give credit to God, but they're all God's principles. That, that. All right, let, me just, no, let me just back up a little bit. Just, I was going to say something, but anyway, I won't say it. Um, love the Lord your God with all your heart, mind, soul, and strength. So you love God and you use money. Let me just say, say this. One of the traps of multi-level marketing and I know there are people, but I'm just saying this. Jesus said, I say to you, use money to make friends for yourselves so that when you fail, they may receive you in everlasting habitations. One of the reasons that I've had it every, every year, people say, Pastor, if you could just, you know, you could be the head of the pyramid and we could give all this money to the church. And they always say, and we could give 10%. I'm like, well, you should be giving 10% now, Jack Wagon. You just told me why I'm not trusting you. And uh, <clears throat> if you've got to have money before, anyway. And so, so, so if you're using friends to make money, you got it around the wrong way. Jesus says use money to make friends. He doesn't say use your friends to make money. Can I just tell you this? God has no problem with you having wealth. He does have a problem with wealth having you. He doesn't have a problem with you having things, you having money. He has a problem with things and money having you. The greatest antidote to things having you is giving. Because anything you have that you can't give, you don't have, it has you. Whatever you can't give, you don't own, it owns you. For God so loved the world, He gave His only begotten Son. God did not withhold the greatest treasure in heaven because God isn't owned by anything, but He owns everything. If you have something that you can't give, you don't own it, it owns you. That's, that's why the rich young ruler comes to Jesus and he says, good teacher, what do I do to that I may inherit eternal life? In other words, hey, how do I add eternal life to my stash? And Jesus says, well, you know the commandments. He says, oh, know the commandments. These I have kept since I was a youth. And Jesus is like, really? That makes just two of us. All righty, all righty. I'm about to give everything on a cross. He says, one thing you lack Sell what you have, give to the poor, follow me, you'll have treasure in heaven. 
And the Bible says that this, the rich young ruler went away sad, having great riches. The truth is he didn't have great riches. Great riches had him. So a lot of people twist that verse or misread that verse. They say, see, see, Jesus says you should give away everything and just be poor. Jesus never said to, to give away everything. Nowhere did Jesus say have nothing. He says you've got to be willing to give. He was testing us. There's one thing you lack. Now watch this. If Jesus wanted him to have nothing, he would have just said give everything away. But he didn't. He said sell what you have and then give it to the poor. Why, 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 would, why would you go off, start an offer up account and put every, list everything, list the price? Well, I know I paid this much for it, but to sell it in the marketplace, I've got it. The reason Jesus said, sell what you have and then give, rather than just, you know, just, hey, let people just come over and take all your stuff. The reason Jesus said, sell what you have is because he's trying to dislodge this guy's status and his identity from his stuff. And he's like, oh, you think your Rolex, oh, you pay 25 grand for that? Put it on an offer up and see how much it's worth. 12 grand, that's the highest bit. Yeah. And, and, and your Bentley, how much? You paid half a million for that? Guess how much it is worth that? He's trying to shift the guy that you have put your trust into things that depreciate, into things that lose their shine, their shimmer, their value. You should have your your worth and your value in kingdom things. God wants you to be a producer. Now, people people say, well, you know what, Pastor? I just think that you know the Bible really behoves us to you know to 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 not be greedy, but just to make enough for ourselves. Do you know what the definition of greed is? Just enough for yourself. I'm like, are you even listening to yourself right now? Pastor, we shouldn't. You know, that prosperity gospel, that's Joel Osteen. Friend, God's got a plan for you. You know, you, you, got, you got this prosperity thing. You should just have enough for yourself. That way you're not selfish. Darling, the definition of selfish is just enough for yourself. The Bible says that you are to be blessed to be a blessing. God wants you producing more than you need. Why? Because if you only produce enough for yourself, what a small vision. What a terrible vision. You're never meant to have a vision. Jesus said to the disciples, lift up your eyes and look. See, the fields are white under harvest. See the need. If all you ever see is just your own needs and your own wants and your own bills and your own, what a terrible life. God wants you to make more than what you need. Why? Because I can guarantee you, you can make an appointment with Pastor John or Pastor Charles and we can help you find a home for that excess revenue and that excess harvest and that excess income. And man, what do I do with all these millions? Um, I can tell you there are buildings to be built. There are territory that need to be taken. There are schools that need to be started. There are orphanages that we're looking after. There are villages in Peru that we're taking. You can never have too much, but you can certainly have not enough. And the, 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 the antidote is, the, the truth is, if you get a vision bigger than your own life, you, you'll, you'll always have a, a purpose for what you produce. God wants producers. God wants producers. Now, let me just say this. I didn't say it in the 8.30. If you go to the book of Judges chapter 16, Judges chapter 16, it's the story of Samson. And I just want to show you that there is a spirit in this world. You will hear us rail continuously, defiantly against the spirit of the world. Now, the problem, the problem is every single one of us came up through the education system of the world. In Daniel chapter 1, King Nebuchadnezzar steals from the kingdom, young, good-looking, without blemish, and he appoints for them three years of training, three years of education, re-education in the language and the literature of the Chaldeans so that they might serve before the king. The, The world's economy is different to heaven's economy. The world's value system is different to heaven's value system. The reason that you get tweaked, the reason you get a little bit ah in church is because kingdom is pressing on worldly. The worldly stuff is perishing. The worldly stuff is empty. The world, worldly stuff is, is anti the things of God. The things of heaven and the things of the kingdom are eternal. They will, they, they, they will cause you to flourish. They will cause you to increase. So when you come to church on a Sunday, you should feel a little bit of a tweak. And man, that makes me feel uncomfortable. It's good because it's a clash of kingdoms. It's a clash of worldview. It's a clash of values. It's a clash of paradigms. It's a clash of mindsets. It's a clash of mindsets. 
So the spirit of the world is there. Samson, Samson, they, they take away his strength. And when they take away his strength, they bore out both of his eyes and remove his vision. He's then sent into their fields to grind their corn. And then they bring him out to perform. The education system of this world will take you through school and then from school into college and then into your career, into debt, into a mortgage. And the spirit of the world will take away your strength. It'll take away any kingdom vision because it wants you to be grinding its corn. What we're experiencing in the world right now with Klaus Schwab and the World Economic Forum and by 2030, by 2030 you will own nothing. The Bible says that the ransom of, of a man's life is his riches. I didn't say that. The Bible says it. The ransom of a man's life is his riches. If you own nothing, you have nothing to ransom your life. These reprobates believe that the world is overpopulated. They want to get it from seven point something billion to under one billion. And if you own nothing, you have nothing to... Ra- the, the, I'm telling you, the... It's the devil. They will, they will, they will snuff you out. They, they're going to try and take your homes. They're going to try and take your stuff. They're going to try and to, they say, why buy it when you can rent it? They, because they know that the rich rules over the poor and the borrower is servant to the lender. There's, there's a saying in the world that he who holds the gold makes the rules. They want to hold all the gold because they want to make all the rules. Rules that don't care about you, your future, your family, your livelihood. So there's a war going on. But the war is already ingrained in you and I because of an education system that we see in Samson. It'll take away your strength. It'll take away your vision and it'll put you as a grinder that comes out to perform. But in the kingdom of God, you're meant to live with vision and you're meant to be a producer and you're meant to have a, have a kingdom mindset and a kingdom paradigm operating kingdom principles and increase, enlarge and advance. The last one, the last one is, he says, I've married a wife, therefore I cannot come. What, what does that mean? I married a wife. This is a man This is a man who doesn't just make a promise. He's a keeper, a promise keeper. This this is a man, he says, I married a wife. I married a wife. In other words, he fell in love. He let love lead his life. He let love lead his heart. He then goes to the father and asks permission, can he court this young lady? The father, after an interview, feels, okay, sets some boundaries. He keeps all the boundaries. Then he comes back to the father and says to the father, may I put a ring of engagement, of betrothment on your daughter's hand to to let everybody else know she's now spoken for. She's no longer available. The father gives permission. He hasn't just won the father, but he's wooed and won this young lady. And there came a day where there was a day on the calendar where he stood at an altar and he exchanged vows before heaven and before witnesses. This is a man that follows through on his promises. This is a man of integrity. The three people that were invited intrigued me because they, they, these, aren't, these aren't flailing. These are people who can take territory. These are people who can produce in the gift, in the marketplace. And these are people who make vows and follow through. These are promise makers and promise keepers. Today we have, if you, if you buy real estate in San Diego, in California, you got to sign it. You got to sign all these. The, the reason is because we don't trust anymore because people have caveats and people try and get out of the no fault divorce. And this, this is a man who makes a promise and keeps it. A man is snared by the words of his mouth. A man is snared by the words of his mouth. I remember when we, when we moved here, 2005, they had a vision builders in May in Australia. And, uh, we owe we owe ten thousand. We had ten thousand left on our vision builders, and I had a check coming from books that I'd sold. It was meant to have got there before the dinner, but it didn't arrive before the dinner. So I called my accountant, saying, "Man, you know it's vision builders tonight." I feel ten, and and he says, "Listen, it'll be in your account by tomorrow." So at the dinner, Pastor Phil Pringle said, "Listen, um, why don't you make another pledge for next year, and whatever you owe from last year, just roll it into this one." And I said to Leanne, "I said, babe, like even though we're moving to San Diego in a couple of months." 
let's let's just let's just sow a seed back into the house that sent us, the house that built us. And so I said, let's just do another ten thousand. So the ten thousand that we owed plus the new ten thousand is twenty thousand. So, but I'm thinking I've got a check that's going to hit my account tomorrow. Uh, you know. I'll pay the 10,000, 10 from 20 leaves 10,000 left. So we're giving a commitment of, of 10, you know, but it's anyway. So I do the 20,000. The next day, the check comes in, Sterling. I, I go up to the church. I hand in my 10,000. I explain to the accountant. He's like, yeah, yeah, you know, the 20,000. Yep, you've already done 10. You got 10 left. I'm like, great. Well, that Sunday in church, Pastor Phil's up there on the, on the platform. And he's like, you know, doing the vision builder scenes, all excited and carried away. He goes, yeah, yeah, youth guy. I'm like, oh, it's um, Pastor Jurgen. I've been with you for seven years. Yeah, yeah, whatever. Yeah, get up here. Yeah. And he starts punching me. Yeah. There's the youth guy. It's the youth pastor. You know, and, uh, yeah, this youth guy is going to plant a church. He says, it's, it's, um, it's, it's Jurgen. Yeah, yeah, whatever. And he goes, yeah, him and his wife, they're going to, going to San Diego. They're going to plant a church. Yeah, these guys are going to plant a church. He goes, and they're church planning, and they're giving $20,000. And I wanted, him to, I wanted to correct him. I said, well, actually, no, I pledged because you said to roll over, and then the money wasn't coming in, it wasn't on, but it came in the next day. That was Friday, two days ago. I've already paid 10. I've got, but as he said the 20000 people went, oh, what? And people... And so I'm like, well, <laughs> and I thought, you know what, you know, far, I don't want to rob their joy. <laughs> so I thought, I'll just, I'll just, I'll, I'll explain to him later. So anyway, we had a piece of land that we bought because we didn't realize God was going to call us to San Diego. And it was a one acre. It was a miracle. God did a miracle. We took, we're territory takers in Australia. And, uh, but you can't rent a piece of land to someone for 6,000 a month to put a tent on it. So we tried to sell it, you know, but it was costing us 6,000. We were hemorrhaging 6,000 a month. And, uh, and three times when it was in escrow, three times it fell out of escrow. So Leanne, my wife, is saying to me, see, that's because you still owe money. I said, babe, Babe, oh my gosh, math is not your strong suit. I pledged 20. 10 came in the next day. Uh, call, call Glenn Henry, the accountant. I paid the 10. We had 10 left over. I've paid that 10. She goes, I don't care what you say. I don't care what you say. You stood on that platform and, and he said 20 grand and you received all the accolades. I said, I know, but what part do you not understand? I put 10 in on the Friday. That 10 from 20 leaves 10 left. And then I paid that other 10. We own it. She goes, no, nope, you still owe 10 grand. I'm like, woman. And so we're fighting. So fourth time it goes into escrow and it falls out. I look at my account. I've got 11,000. I don't even have enough for two months more mortgage payments. And I'm like, oh, dear God. So I get up. It's like four something in the morning and I'm angry with God. And so I go for this walk and I'm sitting on this park bench. And I just thought, I'm just going to let God have it. Like I'm, I'm over here in San Diego planning a church for you. Taking all the risks. The least you can do is have a freaking escrow close. How hard is that, almighty God? <laughs> so I'm giving it to God. I'm giving it to God. And then, then I decide, oh, you know, I feel like God's like, you know, backing up like, wow, he's right, Gabriel. You know, so I'm thinking. So I pipe off a little bit more. I get a little bit bold. I'm like, yeah, God, what's wrong with these people? They make a commitment and they can't follow through to complete. And it was literally as the words came out of my mouth, it's like the Holy Spirit show, put a mirror and says, they do what? Oh, they make a commitment and don't follow through to... Co-. And I'm like, oh, oh, oh. <laughs> Trying to get the word, but it was too late. So I remember walking home with my tail between my legs. Waking little Annie, go, baby, you were right. She goes, I know. And go back. I knew I married Miss Wright. I just didn't realize her first name was always. So I send $10,000. I've only got 11 in the account. I can't even make this month's mortgage payment. I'm like, oh, dear God, this is going to be ugly. They're going to foreclose. It's going to be ugly. The next day, 24 hours later, the realtor who was our first realtor from the first offer, the first one that was in escrow, said, oh, my gosh, look, I know I'm not your, your current realtor, um, but the first, the first uh, guy that I brought to you, the client, 
his home just sold like for an all cash offer. And he wants to know, is the, the land still available? I did a check and I saw that was in escrow. I didn't tell her it had just fallen out. And she goes, so he said he'll give you 200 above asking. I said, let me pray about it. <laughs> Amen. Amen. Yes. Yes. Now, for 18 months, for 18 months, we were trying to sell it. Three times and then a fourth time, fallout, fallout, fallout. As soon as I honoured the promise, as soon as I kept the vow, something was unlocked. Something was released. Pastor John was sharing the same thing. Now, let me just say this, that you can be in, engaged in the activity of taking territory. You can be engaged in productivity, producing, harvest and prospering. Or you can be so keeping promises that you have the best relationships and friendships. But the Bible says that the master was angry, was offended because they allowed those things to keep them from the master's table. They allowed those things to keep them away from the kingdom. Don't let territory taking and don't let success in the marketplace and don't let relationships. You know, one of the saddest things that we've seen, um, Pastor John and Becky, over the years is son and daughter will get saved and controlling mama that is already kind of at a loss that son and daughter have their own life and she doesn't have hooks in them. But because of son, it's amazing we've seen over the years how they'll organize things on a Sunday. They'll schedule things on a Sunday to make son and daughter choose between church and Jesus says, don't, don't let relationships take you out. Always seek first the kingdom. The same gift that God blessed us with to, for taking territory in the natural is the same gift we use to take territory in the kingdom. The same gift that would cause us to be fruitful and productive in the natural is the same gift we use to bring God glory in the kingdom. If you will live with a kingdom priority, if you'll seek first, if you put God first, you'll have not only success here, but you'll have everlasting life. Blessed is he who eats bread in the kingdom. You can eat bread in the kingdom, being producing, being a territory taker, being productive and having great relationships. Come on, let's stand to our feet as I pray over you. Lift your hands high to heaven. May I just say to you, and I didn't say it here, I said it in the 8.30, that you are, you are, you, you're not just attending a church that's got a cool logo, even though I think it's one of the coolest logos. I love our logo. I, I need you to understand that the kingdom is spirit. The kingdom is spirit. The kingdom is power. The, the kingdom of God is not a matter of words, but one of power. There's a spiritual power at work. When, 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 when you have put your roots down into Awaken, just as Awaken is a territory-taking church, you'll become a territory-taking person. Just as Awaken Church is a church that empowers people to flourish in the marketplace, you're going to flourish in the marketplace. And just as Awaken builds healthy, not dysfunctional, healthy relationships, you're going to find the best friendships and the best relationships in this house. So I want you to lift your hands to heaven. Let me pray a blessing over you. Father, I pray for all of those who have maybe lost homes or, you know, foreclosure. But I declare they don't need to move to another state that God can bless them right here in San Diego. I declare, and I see titles, I see keys, I see exchange, I see territory, I see holdings. Father, I thank you for contracts. I thank you for contracts. I see contracts. I see prosperity. I see increase. I see blessing. And Father, I thank you for the greatest relationships, friendships, best friends I've ever had. I see marriages. From, from single, or maybe you, you're divorced and you've come in broken. Let me just tell you, God is a God of healing. God is a God of deliverance. God is a God of salvation. You know, he, He's a God of restoration. He, he restores. Father, I thank you for the, the, these things. And I pray, Father God, if there's anybody here who's never surrendered, who's not yet in the kingdom, today the way you come into the kingdom is you just receive Jesus Christ as your Lord. You say, Jesus, when you died on the cross, you died to wipe out, blot out all my sin. Today I want to make you master over my life. You'll be in the kingdom under His divine provision and protection. We have a, a, a welcome or response lounge over here and we'll have a Bible and a following Jesus book. If you want to do that today, do that today. If you've got a friend that needs to do that, you take them over there and we'll give them a Bible and a, and a following Jesus book. 
We have connect groups this week. We have uh, uh, this afternoon, I think we have the, the Bayho cleanup. If you want to go down there, uh, I think Isaac Gardner said, if you've got a shovel in two hands or just two hands, you can borrow a shovel. I think it's easier to borrow a shovel than borrow two hands. We're going to have the ministry team open up. If you need breakthrough in any area, the ministry team are going to pray. But Father, I thank you for these beautiful people. Bless them, I pray in Jesus' name. Everybody said, Amen. Amen. God bless you. Wow. What a what made a made word. I hope you enjoyed that as much as I did. Hey, listen, for more information about our church, go to www.awakenchurch.com. Subscribe to our YouTube channel too, if you haven't already and download our app. It is amazing. It is chock full of incredible messages, information about upcoming events, and you can even support our ministry if you feel so inclined. We loved having you with us today. We look forward to seeing you again. God bless you. Live a life that is transformative. Bye for now.